from the Attention Era Media Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I'm Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan today, unfortunately. He is off doing something actually pretty darn awesome. Some might even say it's even more awesome than uh, co-hosting Two Up Front. Uh, he is shooting a commercial, uh, a soccer commercial, actually. He is playing a soccer coach. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. I don't have all the full details for you, but um, he uh, is very thrilled about it. He made an announcement about it on Twitter the other day. Uh, so a very good reason for him to miss being on Two Up Front today. He might join us in the last segment like he uh, sometimes does uh, when he's off um, doing other things. So we'll have to see uh, exactly if that does work out uh, for his schedule. Uh, nevertheless, we've got a great show for you today. Uh, some exciting guests coming on. Uh, two returning guests. We have a new guest coming on the show today also. Uh, we'll get to who all those guests will be in just a minute. Uh, we do want to remind you, of course, that you can listen to the show Tuesdays and Thursdays from 12 to 1 p.m. Central Time, live right here on Spreaker.com. And you can get the show by going to our website, 2UpFrontSoccer.com. Uh, you can find it, of course, on demand on iHeartRadio, on iTunes, Vavil USA, and Spreaker.com as well. Uh, moving, as we said, into um, our guests that we do have today, uh, we'll have three different guests on, all joining us on the shopfutsal.com call-in line. We'll have Dan Lauletta of The Equalizer, Jeff Carlisle of ESPN FC, and making her debut on the show will be R.J. Allen of Backline Soccer. So, uh, some might say it's a woe-so sort of day on Two Up Front. Others might say, hey, it's just cool to see three journalists on the show. No, no players, no coaches today, but we do have some interviews that we're hoping to line up for next Tuesday's show. Uh, one, I will not say who, will involve an FC Kansas City player, and we are working on a Washington Spirit player as well. It's just very difficult this time of year to bring players uh, and coaches onto the show, especially right around Christmas time. So many players are either gone or just aren't doing interviews anymore, and some coaches just you know want to just take a little time with their family and friends and not have to do the hassle that is sometimes uh, an interview because you know sometimes the media we like to pry, of course, and. Uh, that can lead to you know interesting stories. That can lead to all kinds of fun things, depending on who you ask, of course. Well, time now for the opening segment of Two Up Front. Uh, we call it the Kick Around, and it's brought to you by Too Much Metal for One Hand. Three different things I want to have a chat about today on the Kick Around. Uh, one of the first things that uh, is relevant to all MLS fans is the waiver draft. It takes place today at 3 p.m. Eastern time, and the way it works is the waiver draft is consisted of players uh, not eligible for the re-entry or free agency um, and are either out of contract or have not been issued a genuine offer, uh, nor do they have their 2017 options exercise. The MLS offseason is really weird, in all honesty. If you don't understand it, uh, it really is hard to explain. It's kind of like offsides. If you can't explain offsides, it's very difficult to understand what offsides is. My wife was looking over my shoulder as I was preparing for the show uh, last night, and she said, what's the waiver draft? And I kind of looked at her. I was like, well, uh, it is this thing that MLS does to help players uh, get on to teams that don't have a team, in not so many words. And some of you are like, well, that's obviously a very loose version of it. But to an extent, it is. You know, uh, we, we love uh, our drafts here in the United States. And the waiver draft is one of the things that uh, MLS does. Looking at the list of the available players, um, in all honesty, there's not many that really jump out to me. Of course, I'm always looking for players that can help make the New England Revolution a better team. And really looking hard through this list, uh, there's some names on here. You know, Sean Wright Phillips is on here. Julio Baptista is on here. Nick Beasler, I think, would be uh, a good pickup if I'm uh, if I'm New England. A uh, young uh, midfielder that uh, was very dominant in college. Didn't see the field a lot in Portland. Is Matt Beasler's little brother also. So he comes from a family of soccer players. Uh, and could be a player that you could eventually develop into somebody to be a high quality player. I also really like um the one player that is already a revolution um uh, you know native I guess uh the Jordan uh McRae. I've always liked him. He's a, an outside back that could really be a uh, a good addition, a good young attacking uh outside back addition for an MLS team. Whether or not these any of these players get picked, usually a couple will get picked um purely based off the fact that um you know, these, there's 22 teams now in MLS. That's kind of crazy to think about. Atlanta and Minnesota will be taking part in this. And, um, you know, Chicago Fire gets the first pick, and the last pick goes to Minnesota United based off of that. The Revolution are number seven. Traditionally, the Revolution haven't done a whole lot, uh, so we'll see 
if anything actually shakes down from that or not. Uh, another piece of interesting soccer news. Everybody remembers the name Freddie Adu for the most part. If you were a my age, so 24-something-year-old, you know, so when you were a child growing up, uh, you heard about this 14-year-old kid that got signed to a professional contract and uh, was compared to the next Pele and was basically just said to be the next great soccer wonder. Uh, if you if you remember Freddie Adu, you remember the story that goes along with him about the teams that he's played for and um, the crazy things that kind of go around uh, him as well. He uh, He's looking for a new team. So speaking of players that are looking for a new home, uh, Adu spent uh, a year and a half playing for the Tampa Bay Rowdies. Uh, if there's one thing that might be more unstable than Freddie Adu's career, it's probably the NASL. Sorry, not sorry, NASL fans out there, but it's true. Uh, you guys are going down the toilet really fast. But that's not what we're going to talk about. Freddie Adu, uh, he made 13 regular season appearances for the Tampa Bay Rowdies. Aside from that, um, he really didn't do much else. Um, he started seven times and totaled 136 minutes and five appearances this season. Just not really doing anything. And Adu is saying that he hopes to uh, kind of sort things out and uh, looks to take the next step soon. Well, he's taken a lot of steps since he was 14 years old. He's played for 12 clubs in 13 years, according to the Washington Post. I don't really know if there's... Uh, what's, what's really the answer at this point for, for Freddie Adu? He's played in 23 league matches. Um, and he hasn't s- scored in league play since 2012 for any team back when it was he played for the Philadelphia Union. Um yeah, he's been to Finland, he's been to Brazil, he's been to Serbia, MLS, Turkey, France, um, Greece, Portugal. He's been all over the world. Uh, I just, I really don't know if there's a, a real landing place for Freddie Adu. I think he could come in and make some team a little bit better, but he is not nearly the same player that I think he was when he was younger. I think the fact that fame and fortune got to his head, and I just, I just don't think that there is uh, the, the amount of talent that we really were hoping he was going to have. Uh, we, we know that he was projected to be this, this star person and um, never really panned out that way. But he's still a younger guy. He's 27. He still has a lot of time left in his playing career to an extent. But it's finding the right fit. It's finding the team that's willing to take the chance and groom him and help him develop into the player that we all thought he was going to be. Of course, if you, those of you do, that you know, the Rowdies are moving to the, uh, the USL, but they're also looking to go to MLS at some point. But they're going to be doing all of that without Freddie Adu. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about here in the kick around uh, is a little bit more of a rant than an actual news item. I've I've been seeing. Some interesting things taking place since Seattle won MLS Cup 2016. Um, Maybe you've noticed this as well, too, on social media and just on different um, platforms as a whole, that uh, Jordan Morris continues to be um, the one person that a lot of news outlets want to interview to talk about the 2016 MLS Cup victory. Usually, you have a player on like Stefan Fry or Nicholas Ladero or just a player that actually did something. Um, Because let's be honest, Jordan Morris did nothing in the 2016 MLS uh, Cup. It was absolutely embarrassing. I would would say, honestly, that I think that he he, he did absolutely nothing. If you really want to break it down and look at it, Jordan Morris did a whole lot of nothing for 90-plus minutes, and all of a sudden MLSsoccer.com and all of these other, and Sirius XM and a lot of other places are all quick to jump on having Jordan Morris, you know, the, the future of U.S. soccer. He's on our program. Talk about what it was like to, to play in this cup. And sure, it's great to have a player on that was a part of a, you know, an MLS Cup, of course, and he's got a ring now. He's such a young player. Uh, but when you really break it down, uh, Jordan Morris played 108 minutes, and the only stats that he registered was that he was offsides once, and he... Didn't do much else after that. So why is that the player that you want to have on your show? Why not highlight players that actually were a crucial part of the match for Seattle? You know? Why not have Chad Marshall? Why not have Roman Torres? Why not have uh, Nicholas Ladero, as we mentioned, or Osvaldo Alonso? Guys that went to bat for 120 minutes that 
participated in the crucial penalty kick shootout while Jordan Morris sat on the bench and did nothing. I just find it a little little interesting that we are uh, so quick in the soccer community to jump on players that, um, on paper, yes, are great players, but if you're having them on to talk specifically about their performance uh, in, a, in a potential cup final, uh, I, just, I just don't think that Jordan Morris was the right person to have. That's, uh, that's my opinion. I'm sure that there are many people out there that disagree with me, and uh, I welcome that. I like the disagreement. So we're going to run to a break. Well, when we come back, Dan Lauletta of the Equalizer is going to be joining us on the ShopFutsal.com call in line. Stay with us. It's Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. Welcome back to the Attention Era Media Studios. It's Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I'm Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan today. He is off acting, but we'll be back uh, hopefully later on in the show, if not uh, next week uh, at some point as well. He does have surgery coming up next week also. Uh, he is uh, getting a hernery, a hernia surgery. Goodness, I'm going to give myself a hernia by trying to say hernia. Anyway, so uh, we, uh, we wish Simon all the best and uh, look for his return to Two Up Front, hopefully uh, very soon. Uh, when Simon uh, was able to host the show uh, by himself a couple weeks back uh, while I was off uh, traveling for work, he had the opportunity to bring on uh, Dan Lauletta of The Equalizer. He's the managing editor uh, over at The Equalizer. For those of you that are women's soccer fans and soccer fans as a whole, you've probably uh, read something that Dan has written uh, at least once uh, in your career. If, if not, uh, you should. He's a terrific writer and he definitely does a fantastic job of providing an unbiased view of uh, the soccer world. So he is now back on Two Up Front by joining us on the shopfutsal.com call in line. Dan, welcome back, sir. How are we doing today? Doing good, Baxter. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's great to actually speak to you uh, on the phone. Uh, you and I have chatted back and forth multiple times via text and Twitter, but uh, it's nice to finally uh, hear your voice and uh, have a real conversation with you as well. Well, you had good reason for not being on when I was on last time, so I hope, I hope that's going well for you. It absolutely is. Yes, absolutely. I'm uh, very thrilled to, to have missed for that specific reason. So the, the birth of my son, I think, is a, a pretty good reason to call in sick to work any day in my book. For sure. Well, Dan, uh, we have you on the show today to chat about uh, the, the U.S. Women's National Team. Uh, 2016 is officially in the books for them. Uh, they didn't lose a single game in 2016. Uh, some might say the Swedish, the Sweden game, of course, they did end up losing in penalty kicks, but um, they drew in, in regular time, so that's kind of how the result looks. But uh, I'm curious to get your, your overall thoughts before we dive in a little bit more about the 2016 U.S. Men, or U.S. Women's National Team campaign. Well, in the big picture, obviously, the main goal was the Olympics, and they fell short. Not only did they fall short, but they lost before the semifinals for the first time ever at a major global tournament, Be that being the Olympics and the World Cup. So that's never a good thing, and I think they did it in a somewhat uninspiring way, the draw to Colombia in the group stage, uh, which they kind of spun as hashtag win the group, which they did by drawing that match, but it was not an inspiring game. The Sweden game was not so inspiring. Agreed. But, but then you look at what happened after the Olympics, and you have a little bit of hope, maybe, that finally, maybe, uh, with Jill Ellis leading the charge, that we're going to see um, some scared players in the team. And what I mean by that is, you know, Jill wants to make it more, or at least it sounds like she wants to make it, more of an open competition throughout with the U.S. national team. And she certainly tinkered a whole lot after the Olympics were over. Now, they didn't play any significant opponents 
during that time, but they do if they can get the CBA ironed out, and that's a whole other can of worms, <laughs> but if they can get that ironed out, they'll be back in the She Believes Cup. And that's another you know, point that has to be looked at when you look at 2016 is that the U.S. did uh, start the She Believes Cup. They got three of the top countries in the world to come over and play against them, and they're going to do it again. I think they're signed on at least through 2019. Uh, if you're a fan of the Algarve Cup, it's not such a good thing because they did a lot of damage to that tournament. But uh, it is that was another big step for the U.S. So the you know the counter argument there is that they didn't play enough game, they didn't do enough travel and play enough games in enemy territory ahead of the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if I buy into that or not, but it certainly does uh, do a national team good to play some games on foreign soil when it's you know, before the World Cup and the Olympics. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on that one. Yeah, you look across the opponents that they played in 2016. Of course, you go back to that She Believes Cup, Germany, France, and England. Those are three of the very best you're ever going to see in the women's soccer game at the moment. And they beat Canada as well earlier in the year. But I, I really feel like for true fans of the women's national team, and even maybe those that are just kind of casual fans, 2016 is going to be defined, maybe some might say, as a failure because of what happened at the Olympics, despite all the other victories, despite all the great players that were able to kind of come through the system. Do you agree with that, or do you think that's just kind of silly to hear? No, well, like I said, you know, the main objective for the year was to win the Olympic gold medal. And now keep in mind, they won the World Cup in 2015. They had won the last three Olympic gold medals. At some point, you're not going to end up on the top podium. Exactly. Exactly. In one tournament or another, I think you know, I'm a kind of a big believer in the five-year rule. I know that's not fun for hot, the hot take era that we live in now, <laughs> but I think you need to go and wait a little while to kind of see how it plays out. Is this a blip on the radar? Is it the beginning of where the world, quote unquote, catches up, which we've been, you know, saying has been a threat now for the better part of a decade, or is it a combination of the two where somebody? wakes up and says, you know what, we can't win with only 20-some-odd contracted players, and we can't win by trying to force-feed Megan Rapino an injured or coming back from injury Megan Rapino into the lineup, and we can't win just because we quote-unquote wanted more and, and have the best fitness program in the world. As, you know, so maybe it goes down as a failure, but also was the conduit to change some things around in the way the team operates. Exactly, yeah, I would have to agree with you on that one. Talking with Dan Laletta of The Equalizer on theshopfutsal.com. Call in line. Dan, I, I'm curious, too. 2016 saw uh, two familiar faces uh, not be on the roster due to pregnancy, uh, Amy Rodriguez and Sydney LaRue. Uh, based off of what you saw from the forwards and obviously the new emergence of Lynn Williams, we saw Jess McDonald, at least, of course, for a little bit as well, and Kelia Ojai, among others, is there room on this team next year for LaRue and for Rodriguez? It's a great question, Baxter. And, the, you know, they obviously will get an opportunity. The, you know, the, the Federation is obligated of course, yep. to give them an opportunity. The thing about both those players, though, I know Rodriguez had two great years in Kansas City before she went out on maternity leave. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that either one of those two players were guaranteed to be heavily involved in the team, even if they didn't go out. To you know, interesting, pregnancy. yeah. So, so, so I'm not really sure. You know, Amy Rodriguez is a very specific type of forward. I'm not sure that she'll fit into what Jill Ellis wants to do. And to me, to be honest with you, Sydney Larue regressed a little bit in the last year or two before she left the game. And I you don't know how that. they'll you don't know how they'll come back. You know, obviously, it's a physically demanding thing to you know childbirth and of and your course. mentality changes. Now, it can your mentality can change for the better. Or you, you know, it's not Amy Rodriguez's first go round. It was her second child, yep. Sydney, LaRue, Sydney Larue's first. Um, but I think they'll both get an opportunity. I think they both have the skill sets. But uh, if I had to guess, I would say, especially looking as far off as 2019, that I would say there's a better chance that you won't see either one of them. That said, there's not exactly forwards tearing it up and scoring a lot of goals on the team. So that's an area that needs to be addressed. That is very true, yeah. And I think it was good to see um, the emergence of Lynn Williams and, and Kelia Ojai and Jess McDonald. I was a little disappointed, honestly, about Jess McDonald, but uh, we kind of maybe had that thought uh, coming from you know being a little bit older of a player to try to all of a sudden see the, the speed of play where Lynn Williams and, and Ojai are a little bit younger 
uh, and can kind of coordinate, you know, a little bit, maybe a little bit smoother. But yeah, you, you, you look at LaRue, you look at Rodriguez. I don't necessarily know if those are going to be starters um, if they do come back. You know, like you said, there's a lot of talent on this team, but the goals are not coming as much as we're so used to seeing. Um, is that a midfield distribution problem or is that just the forwards themselves just not being able to put the ball in the back of the net? I think it's a combination of things. You know, when you first of all, when you play teams like Romania and Switzerland, they're you know they're not going to spend a lot of time knocking the ball around the midfield and getting beat by your midfield, and exactly. then allowing your forwards to get in behind them. Even if the U.S. scores seven or eight goals or whatever it was in one of those games, so it's a really it's really difficult still in women's soccer. There's not enough depth around the world in women's soccer to go out and get a lot of really quality games. Mm-hmm. You can get games for show, you can get fans, you can get players into the program, but it's you know that's why the She Believes Cup and even the Algarve Cup in the US was there. The opponents there not across the board, but they face good, strong competition. So uh, it's it's tough to say really what the reason is. You know, I think Alex Morgan had an okay year. I think she was actually better in a US jersey than she was when she played in the league. I Agreed. think that uh, Crystal Dunn, I think we need to kind of figure out, you know, where she fits. I think Kristen Press is a player who you put Kristen Press in NWSL, and she's probably the most dangerous player. I think she certainly has the most, what I might call, variety in how and when and where she can score. Agreed. But I haven't seen it yet on the national team level against quality opponents. So, you You're know, right. I have to see. And yeah, the midfield hasn't been spectacular. You know, I think overall it was just kind of a blah year for the for the team on the field. I don't think anybody really stood out in terms of their performance. Um, you know, I don't know that I mean they weren't awful and as you said they didn't actually lose a game, but you know, PKs to Sweden when they absolutely should have won that game. You You're look right. at the other you know, draw to Colombia ninetieth minute, draw against Japan when they rally. I mean to Japan friendly in the Columbia games, how many times have you ever seen the US trail take the lead and not win the game. And that mm-hmm. happened twice to them this year. Exactly. Yeah, that definitely is a, a somewhat might say a cause for concern. Uh, another thing too, just stepping away from the actual game itself is the the overall support of the women's national team. I'm looking at the attendance numbers from all of these games. Uh, I'm not really seeing much over, I think 23,000, 25,000, I guess looks to be the, the largest attended game that, that one nil victory over France back in Nashville. But as much as we hear people continuing to advocate for women's soccer in the United States, is the is the the loud mouths of the you know people advo- advocating for it not? It doesn't seem like it's translating over to people actually showing up to watch arguably the best team in the world. I don't know. I think we're a bit of a big event society. I think we force fed the team a little bit with ten games after the World Cup win. Agreed. Last year, and that was tied in with Abby Wambach eventually admitting that she was retiring and then the her final game and some of those games down in the in the southeast there maybe cannibalize themselves i think women's soccer's in a very very good position yes right now but i don't think you can just say hey we're the national team we're coming to your stadium and fill it up yeah but, gr- of course yes but but i i think i think it's okay i think that the she believes copy of marketed properly and there was some odd marketing around that they couldn't sell a sponsor they couldn't get all the games on television, I haven't heard anything about dates and venues for 2017, but again, the collective bargaining agreement hangs over everything at this point in time. Uh, I think that could be a real big event because, again, you have some quality countries coming, quality teams coming in to play opposite them. So I wouldn't read too, too much into it, but, you know, I think it's fine. I do think it takes work, and I think that, uh, you know, I'd, honestly, I'd like to see the, the pro league you know, a little bit more resource in the pro league and not worry so much about all the U.S. friendlies, although I know, you know, I know there's a benefit to those also. Of course, of course. Well, Dan, it's been a pleasure, sir, to have you on the show. Uh, hopefully we can uh, have Simon and I talk to you at the same time at some point, but uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on, so thanks for taking some time today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Baxter. Enjoyed it. Absolutely. There goes Dan Laletta on the shopfutsal.com call-in line. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to jump over to MLS and have Jeff Carlisle of ESPN FC join us. Just listening to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I'm Baxter Colburn, here from the Attention Era Media Studios. No Simon Provan today. He'll be back again, uh, hopefully next week at some point, following surgery and acting and all kinds of other great things that he's got going on for his career. So uh, an exciting time for Simon, uh, to say the least. Uh, we will be joined by Jeff Carlisle of ESPN FC in just a moment. Uh, but we do want to take a minute, of course, to remind you that you can listen to Two Up Front by going uh, to our website, twoupfrontsoccer.com. And, of course, you can listen to it live Tuesdays and Thursdays from 12 to 1 p.m. Central Time, live right here on Spreaker.com. With all that being said, we head over to the shopfutsal.com. Call in line and welcome in ESPN FC reporter Jeff Carlisle to the program. Jeff, welcome back to Two Up Front, sir. Hey, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, Jeff. It's great to have you back on. I am excited to talk a little MLS with you. Uh, The expansion draft taking place for Atlanta and Minnesota United, both teams getting five uh, selections to uh, shape the overall skeleton of their team going into 2017. What did you think of the expansion draft? Was there any players actually worth taking that uh, teams actually took? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think Minnesota did all right. Um... You know, I, it seemed, you know, just in looking at the two teams, you know, Atlanta is obviously a lot further along in building out their team than, than Minnesota is. You know, yes, they've, yep. they've signed some, some designated players, and, uh, you know, they just seem to, you know, obviously, you know, there's reports that Oscar Romero is going to join them. You know, Miguel Amaron is already on the books. So, uh, you know, it, it was, I think for Atlanta, it was more about asset accumulation. Um, you know, obviously, they, they traded... Clint Irwin back to Toronto and, and got Mark Bloom in return and some money. And then, uh, you know, they sent Donnie Toya to, uh, to Orlando. And so, uh, you know, I, I guess if I had one surprise um, in terms of Atlanta's picks, it would be Zach Lloyd. Uh, he's on a big number, you know, over mm-hmm. 200 grand in salary. He's also been dealing with concussions for the last five months. So I've, you know, heard some, some conflicting reports about whether he's cleared to play. But, you know, Carlos Bocanegra... Uh, Atlanta's technical director, uh, you know, insisted that that you know he's talked to Lloyd and, and Lloyd is good to go. So, uh, I think Lloyd slots in as more of a right back than a center back because Atlanta already has Michael Parkhurst. And if you were to play those two guys in the middle, I think that would be a little bit too undersized. I think alongside Parkhurst, you need a guy who's more of a physical presence. And so, you know, I would see Lloyd uh, moving into right back. But um, you know, overall, uh, you know. It's, you know, I think Atlanta did well. I, I, I think, you know, Minnesota, like I said, needed a little bit more help. You know, they needed more guys who were going to play right away. And I like the, the picks of Colin Warner and Mohamed Saeed. Um, you know, those, you know, if, you know, if Adrian Heath is going to play four two three one, I think he's got his two holding mids right there. Agreed, yeah. And um, so it's, and, and they're a good combination. You know, Colin, you know, Colin Warner is more kind of a, a pure destroyer holding midfielder type, you know, Saeed is a guy who can link the play a little bit more. Um, so, you know, I think that that could be a good tandem, um, you know, just in terms of, uh, you know, and I like what they did in, in the Chris Duvall trade too, getting Johan Venegas. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Venegas is going to provide, you know, that creative presence in the middle. Um, you know, he's been kind of up and down with Montreal, but, Obviously, uh, he showed against the U.S. in World Cup qualifying you know, how uh, <laughs> yes. deadly he can be in front of goals. So, uh, you know, I, I like that pickup. And, and Femi hollinger Jansen's a little bit more of a long-term project. But, you know, Adrian Heath does have a track record for, for developing strikers. You know, he did some good work with Don Dwyer when, when Orlando was in the, the USL. And yes. then, you know, Kyle Aaron has, has also emerged as a, as a really uh, excellent forward in MLS. So, uh and, and, and Hollinger Jensen did well in some limited minutes with New England this year. So, you know, I think all told, uh, you know, Minnesota did well. And they got Jeff Antonella, who a lot of people are high on and, and think is a goalkeeper that can start right away in this league. So I would say Minnesota got more immediate help, but that's what they needed. So, uh, you know, I think it was a case of mission accomplished for them. And I think it might be a little too early to, to play this game, Jeff, but it's always fun to, to play, you know, prediction, of course. Uh, Minnesota, they're going to be in the West, uh, while Atlanta's going to be in the, some might argue, easier Eastern Conference. Do one or both of these teams have a, sh- a true shot at at least qualifying for the playoffs next season? Based off of the first initial moves that you've seen, I know obviously we don't have the full roster, so we can't make a, a huge prediction. But based off the directions these two teams are going, do you have you gotten any sense at all that one or both of these teams might actually have what it takes to make a push? Uh, 
I mean, I, think, I like what Atlanta has done so far. Um, I, I want to see how they fill out, you know, the remainder of their back line. Um, you know, they, they've got some fantastic attacking pieces, uh, like with Almiron and, and Romero, who I mentioned before, and of then Edwin Jones is, you know, a, a, an excellent target striker. So, uh, you know, and, and uh, yeah, so you know, I think Atlanta has has, has got some some great pieces in that regard, but. You know there is there is chemistry. You know there is you know trying to become a team, and obviously that's a that's a huge challenge for an expansion team. I mean, there, there's always that impulse to say, well, I mean, I remember people saying, well, Orlando's going to make the playoffs, or NYCFC is going to make the playoffs, but you know both of those teams struggle to to keep balls out of the net. You know now Parkhurst is obviously a you know kind of a ball playing center back, so he's got a ton of experience in the league. You know that's that's a nice piece, um, but I, I want to see. You know how they fill up the, the rest of that back line, and uh, you know they also got Jeff Lorenowitz. We'll see how many games yeah. that he's expected to start. You know he's a, he's a he's a holding midfielder. I mean, obviously, you know there were some questions that were thrown at me on Twitter yesterday about, hey, is he a center back? You know, like he was in his latter days with Chicago, or is he a midfielder? He, he this guy is a midfielder. I think that was an experiment that didn't work out terribly well in <laughs> Chicago, although you know not a whole lot did by the time. Uh, you know, in you know that last season that Lorena Woods was there. So, um, you know, we'll see how much how many games he's going to be counted on to to play. But, um, you know, they're making smart moves and and they're getting. It looks like Atlanta's getting contributions from every single one of the various player pipelines. I mean, you know, they've really mined the international market. They have uh, obviously started to get some good some good picks in the expansion draft. Um, you know, we'll see. You know, they. they Obviously, getting free agents. We'll see how they do in the draft, and that's what they really need. I mean, I think that was Seattle's secret. You know, in 2009, was you know, I think previous expansion teams had relied a lot on domestic players, uh, but Seattle, I think, you know, with Freddie Montero, you know, he he was a player that that you know they got inter- on the international yeah. um, market that really helped them and gave them a, a lot of credibility and, and it was a huge threat up front. So. Uh, so I, I think Atlanta is much more likely, but again, it, it's it's one thing to look at these teams on paper, and it's another to to see how they do on the field. So uh, you know, if they can get a center back or two that provide that physical presence, then I will really like their chances of making the postseason. I would agree with you on that one too. Last thing before we let you go here, uh, Jeff, as we're talking to Jeff Carlisle on the shopfootsell dot com call in line. Uh, Taylor Twelman had talked about this briefly, but uh, the the rumors that Tim Ream might be coming to MLS and saying that Minnesota might be a, a thing, but I know that there's not there wasn't a whole lot of water to that that statement. But is this going to be a potential thing that we're going to see now with some more uh, either U.S. men's national team players that have kind of fallen out of suit, uh, looking to come back to maybe these new expansion teams for a new possibility and teams that you know need a a star, quote unquote, to help fill out their roster. You know, it's uh, you know, Reem is an interesting player. You know, he's on a fairly big number, um, but at some point, all of these guys that are overseas, you know, especially as they get married and start to have families, you know, mm-hmm. they want to want to be back in the, in the United States, close to family, and and so you know the the grandparents can can watch their grandchildren grow up and and all sorts of things like that. So you know we'll see. I mean you know Reem's agent has come out on record saying that he's not going anywhere. So we'll you know whether that's a negotiating ploy or not or a way to protect themselves against any kind of tapping up charges that might get lodged. Uh, you know I think that remains to be seen. But um, you know, there, I think there's some interest, but I, I think with regard to Reem, there's a long way to go. Addressing your broader question about guys coming back, I mean, there are really not that many left. True. Um, you know, there's there's Jeff Cameron. Um, who I who think knows, is maybe Fabian Johnson can come back. I had seen but, rumors um, about Fabian to uh, Atlanta, but I never really heard much about that afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I would. I, I think if if you're a player that is still getting steady playing time in one of the best leagues and you're making good money. Um, 100% agree. You yeah. know, I, I think you ought to stay there. Um, <laughs> exactly. I, you know, I, I mean, obviously, I kind of broke the bank with guys like Clint Dempsey, like Michael Bradley, Josie Altador. You know, they really wanted to to bring those guys back, you know, kind of a hometown discount. or well, not even a discount, almost a hometown premium. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I think Fabian Johnson is, is is not quite as well known, so I I, I just 
I have, I have a hard time thinking that guys like John Brooks or Fabian Johnson or, or even uh, Timothy Chandler would, would be interested in coming to, to MLS. So, uh, and so that doesn't really leave too many names left. I think Jeff Cameron's pretty ensconced at Stoke. So, uh, you know, but we'll see what happens. Absolutely. Well, Jeff, uh, it was great to have you on the show, even for a brief time. Uh, where can people find your work and find you on social media? Uh, always go to, to ESPNFC.com. Uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, you hit the search bar and just put in Jeff Carlisle. You get a whole list of uh, the articles that I've written. And then on, uh, on Twitter, I'm at, at Jeffrey Carlisle. Uh, so that's, that's the way to find me there. Fantastic, Jeff. Always a pleasure, Sure, Let's do it again soon. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. There goes Jeff Carlisle on theshopfutsal.com. Call in line. We're going to take a break. We'll come back and we'll have RJ Allen joining us of Backline Soccer. You're listening to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lions Pub from the Attention Era Media Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan joining me uh, today. He's off. He'll be back again, uh, hopefully next week or maybe in the next segment. I'm not officially sure. I haven't gotten the text room yet saying, hey, I'm free. Uh, but I'm assuming more than likely he will not be joining us, uh, unfortunately, today. We've had a great show. We've had two fantastic guests already. We had Jeff Carlisle of ESPN FC and Dan Lauletta of The Equalizer. Now we get to cap off the show with the, the pinnacle guest, the one that everyone has been waiting for. Uh, she's the editor-in-chief over at Backline Soccer. It's RJ Allen, and she joins us on theshopfutsal.com. Call in line. RJ, how are we doing today? I'm doing all right. Between finals at the moment. Between finals? Come on, RJ. I, I thought you were a professional soccer writer that was a, an advocate for the women's game. You don't have time for school. Uh, I'm in my final semester of college. I have one final left uh, after today, and I'm done with school. So <laughs> I'm getting and you can finally just be like, I am free! Enough of this r- ridiculous college stuff. It's just It gets annoying after a while, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> well, RJ, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on to up front. Uh, one of the things uh, I want to chat with you about today um, is uh, some good news for the NWSL. Uh, as the league has announced that it's going to do, a, um, people are calling it a modest increase to the salary cap. Uh, the salary cap is going to go up to $278,000. Um, well, it operated under that last year. And it's going to be getting a little bit of a bump um, in 2017. Uh, when you when you heard about this, uh, what were your initial reactions? I think it's a good step. Um, I think we're we're always going to be fighting a little bit to to raise wages, sort of to a level I think everybody is a little more comfortable with. Um, I don't mind smaller increases versus having to increase it a lot and then slowly work it back down. I think it's better to sort of go forward a little slower and not have to go backward than to take a huge step forward 
and have to come back a couple times. Agreed. Yeah. And that's always the biggest thing. Um, I, myself and Simon have talked about this on the show before, and I've talked about it with other players as well. Um, even just in general conversations that, uh, you hear everything that's going on with the women's national team right now with them fighting for equal pay, equal play, but, a lot of times, just the standard NWSL players just kind of get left in the dust. Um, a lot of them have to go and work, you know, multiple jobs in the off season just to make enough money to, you know, pay the bills and you know be able to still stay in the same city that they that they currently play in instead of having to go home to you know mom and dad's house or other things like that. So I think that this at least will hopefully help. Um, you know, keep some of those players, you know, not, not, in, not to be rude about it, but to keep them off the streets, you know, to an extent, you know, it's like, you got to, you have to be able to pay these women a, a, an honest wage. Yeah. And, and I think that it's a, it's a difficult situation because it's not sort of a free market. It's very much a constructed market where, where the league decides or the teams decide how much they can pay people versus sort of, well, I can go work, you know, at this place or I can go work in this place. So it's a little bit different than I think people generally think about, you know, free market economies and all that. Yes, yes, exactly. I would would agree with you on that one. But I think that this is certainly a good step for for the NWSL in terms of getting, you know, a little bit more money in the pockets of those of these players, especially that uh, many would argue uh, deserve many, many more dollars than they're getting paid. Um, you hear even about the rookies sometimes getting paid, you know, single digits in the thousand dollar realm, which is which is ridiculous to kind of think about when you when you really break it down. Um, one of the other things I want to I want to talk to you about, RJ. Uh, we were we were going at it a little bit on Twitter in a in a good way. We were actually in agreement. But um, you had posted recently uh, saying that you believe that Amy Rodriguez is the better forward than Sydney LaRue. And I 100% agree with you on that one. And, um, <laughs> uh, and those that were listening to the show earlier uh, heard Dan Lauletta basically echo the same thing and really say that Sydney LaRue has fallen off the face of the earth over the last year and a half when she was actually playing. Not, of course, because she had a baby. You can't play while you have a baby. That's ridiculous. But um, I, I, I'm curious, number one, what's, what's, what spawned your idea uh, to, to say something like that and why you believe that? I I think that a lot of sort of the new fans, the fans that came in since the World Cup, um, they don't really know who Amy Rodriguez is in sort of a, a way of, you know, the 2008 team or the 2012 Olympic team or, you know, the, the World Cup teams they're in. I think that a lot of people just think that she's either an offside machine in FC Casey or, <laughs> you know, she, she's, you know, Tobin Heath and Lauren Holiday's buddy. They don't really know her as a player. Um, and I hear, you know, her China game in the World Cup in 2015 wasn't great. Well, besides the first ball that she sort of mishit, I think she had a fine game. And I think she she always paired well with the other forwards, either Abby Lombach or Alex Morgan or, you know, whoever she was paired with. I think she's sort of one of those players that we've been missing because she can just work with everybody. Um, and, I, and I think that she's sort of, you know, she gets discounted a lot um, because she's not a super flashy player or because she doesn't have a strong social media presence. And I was talking to one of my friends um, who likes FC Casey, and we were talking, and she's like, yeah, I'm more excited about, you know, Amy coming back than I ever would be for Sid playing. Yes, because yep. Amy you know, can score her goals and can can sort of help people out. You know, she can act almost as an attacking mid at times. Mm-hmm. Um, where where Sid is more of a sort of a a brutal forward. She likes to sort of overpower people. And I and I don't necessarily think in the league that's gonna work and I don't think on the national team that's gonna work anymore. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on that one. There was definitely um Anytime Sydney LaRue was on the field for the the Women's World Cup, I was just I just felt like she almost looked awkward on the field. I just never got the sense that she really knew what was going on. We saw a lot of just non characteristic play from her and I, I would definitely think that Rodriguez, when she was on the field, looked much more confident and really had a clearer uh, feeling of what was supposed to happen, and you know, obviously, both players are going to get an opportunity to play when they when they are both declared you know fit to play again. Um, but I really just don't know if uh, if both of those players have a future uh, on the women's national team, especially with the emergence of uh, with Lynn Williams and Kelia Ohai and uh, a lot of other young, talented players coming through the system. And of course, you've always got those roadblocks of Alex Morgan and Kristen Press, you know, trying to trying to combat those ladies to get playing time as well. 
Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think any of them will be around long term. Um, I think they'll both get the courtesy call up if there's a January camp, if, if the CBA is negotiated and they end up having a camp in January. Sure. Both of them, both of them will get called. I think Amy Rodriguez is more likely to just retire at this point. She's got her World Cup. She's got her Olympics. She's got two Olympic gold medals. You know, she, she sort of has everything that, that she could want. On a professional level, she might, you know, come and play for FCK. So sort of like Heather O'Reilly is expected to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, FCK tends to be, at least in 2015, as the retirement home for the women's national team. <laughs> you sort of got to go there when, once you were done playing. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't really see any, you know, place going forward for either of them. Um, if Lauren Holiday was still there, maybe, you know, you have some value in having an Amy Rodriguez because they had such natural chemistry on the field. Hmm. But, yeah, I don't really see either of them sticking around. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on that one. Last thing I want to talk to you about, RJ, before we let you roll, uh, is, is, is a bit funny, I think, depending on who you ask. And I, I did a little bit of research on this and haven't seen much about it, but it's a, a new soccer league that might be starting, uh, supposedly in 2017. Um, I'll, I'll let you do the honors of explaining what it is and what the heck is wrong with it. Uh, well, uh, one of my writers actually wrote about this. It's the Lingerie Football League, uh, Lingerie Soccer League, one of the, one of the two. I don't remember which. I think it's the soccer one. Yeah, actually, I think it's LSL yeah. or something, yeah. Um, so it's basically, uh, women in sports bras and underwear playing soccer. Now, my first question was, are we going to play on natural grass because those perforations <laughs> would be the absolute worst? Followed quickly by my second thought of, if they have better pitches than the NWSL and US Women's National Team, I'm going to be really pissed. Um, so it's sort of not good either way you look at it. It's either they get better, sort of, you know, facilities than the than the NWSL, or they get worse and sort of are put in more physical harm mm-hmm. um, because they don't have sort of any protection on them. Um, I think it's I think we're past this. I think we have to sort of, you know, yes, do we want sort of men watching women soccer? Absolutely. Should we have something like this where oh, you get to see some boobs or you get to see some cleavage or somebody's butt a little bit better. No, I, I think I think this is degrading to the women who are playing in it because there are going to be women who play in it because mm-hmm. they can't, they either can't make it in in the NWSL or they're going to possibly get paid more depending on, you know, if it's, I don't know what their pay structure is going to be, but I mean, there's a possibility that they're going to get some amount of pay that might be more than an NWSL rookie. Yeah, um, that, that was the thing, too. So I, I could see more mainstream media getting behind this just because, unfortunately, that's just kind of how the, the mainstream media is now. I could see a, a bigger company getting behind saying, oh, I want to be the sponsor of that league. That sounds great. Well, you know, our Under Armour or Nike or somebody jumping on that be like, well, yeah, if you use our products, we'll give you, you know, a ton of money to go do this. And, oh, we get to see everything that you mentioned as well previously. It's like, well, what, you know, that's a win-win for all parties involved. Yeah, I think, I just, I think we have to, as sort of a culture, say, you know what, it's not worth watching women who are either not very good at soccer or who are good at soccer and just can't afford to play in the league, like, take off most of their clothing and and go on a pitch. I think we just have to, the media has to sort of not be like, oh, look at this oddity, but, like, actually explain why this is, is wrong. Exactly. And, and why this isn't okay. Because us just saying, us just pointing to it and laughing as media, like, people don't necessarily understand if we're pointing laughing. They think it's just something that they should go check out. Yes. No, I, I agree with you on that one, too. I think that at the end of the day, if it's degrading to women, it doesn't make any sense to... It's not doing anybody any favors, honestly, and you have to kind of, to an extent, call into question those those ladies that want to play in a league like that. But uh, we know that that's a, a conversation and a discussion that could go on for far too long than we have, unfortunately, RJ. But uh, I want to I wanna thank you for taking time to join Two Up Front today. Now, before I let you roll, uh, where can people find your work and where can they find you on social media as well? So if you want to find anything with Backline Soccer, go to backlinesoccer.com. It has all of our links to our social media, all that. Uh, we're at Backline Soccer on Twitter and personally on at Captain Bozo on Twitter. Fantastic. RJ, always a pleasure. Let's do it again soon, okay? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. There goes RJ Allen on the shopfutsal.com call in line. When we come back, we'll wrap the show up. Take a look abroad and see what's going on with U.S. soccer and just soccer as a whole. There's so much more to talk about with so little time. It's Two Up Front presented by Three Lines Pub. Stay tuned. Up front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I'm Baxter Colburn here in the Attention Era Media Studios, all by my lonesome self as Simon Provan is off for the day. But uh, we uh, we look forward to having him back again soon. Remember, if you want to interact with the show, you can find us on Facebook. Go to Two Up Front. It's the number two, or you can find us on Twitter at Two Up Front Soccer. I am at Baxter Colburn. And Simon is at Simon Provan. Uh, shoot us an email, too, if you really uh, have a lot to say to us that you can't do in 140 characters. 2upfrontsoccer at gmail.com. And check out the website as well, 2upfrontsoccer.com, to find all the information, the latest and greatest information about the show, about guests that we've had on, about Simon and I, uh, past episodes, etc., 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 etc. All right, uh, looking uh, abroad and uh, near and abroad and everywhere, uh, we'll start abroad and we'll work our way back in here in the final segment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Matt Miazga, probably a name you haven't heard in a long time. Uh, he, uh, he scored his first goal, uh, actually. He, he's been in and out of the lineup at the Dutch club uh, Vitesse uh, since he arrived on loan uh, from Chelsea. He, won, uh, he scored a goal in there. 4-0 win uh, over a 5th Division team, uh, Jodan Boys, in the round of 16 KNVB Cup, for whatever that is worth. Uh, Miazga has played 7 games um, for Vitesse and 4 more for Vitesse 2. Uh, they play in the 3rd Division in the Dutch League. Uh, Rubio Rubin also actually um, has been uh, hanging around but has not played at all for FC uh, Utrecht in almost 4 months. But he was on the bench for a, a recent 2-1 victory that the team had against PEC Zuelo. Uh, so if you're talking about two players that maybe need to come on back to this side of the pond, uh, that might be might be two good players to to take a gander at. Matt Miazga, a young, talented center back, and Rubio Rubin, a talented striker as well. I would definitely get out of the 3rd and 4th and 5th divisions in smaller countries to come play for a MLS team personally. That's that's just my thought. Uh, speaking of the United States, uh, Bruce Arena announced that he is hitching up the wagons, taking the U.S. men's national team job, and he's taken everybody from the L.A. Galaxy staff with him as well. Uh, he's going to take his longtime assistant, Dave uh, Sarachan, his son, Kenny Arena, Pat Noonan, and Matt Reese. Um, well, that is all according to Taylor Twelman, of course, uh, who has been the go-to uh, for information about the soccer world. I, I think the move is great. I think that that keeps the gang all together. I think that if you're a Galaxy fan, you should be terrified because anything and everything that's been good about the Galaxy the last, oh, almost, not a decade, but the decade, you know, the Galaxy's been pretty darn good for a long time. But anything that's been really been good about them has been because of Bruce Arena and because of the staff that he has been able to work with as well. So the fact that he's taking all of his staff with him I think you should be a tad worried about that, uh, Galaxy fans, going into next season. Uh, one other funny thing that's always good to see is uh, the the amount of demand that is out there right now for the 18-year-old Christian Pulisic of Borussia Dortmund. Uh, these offers, you know, the rumors of these offers keep swirling. So we've heard $30 million from Liverpool. And we've heard all kinds of crazy numbers. And, and basically... Uh, it's been funny to hear that uh, the sporting director of Borussia Dortmund, um, Michael Zork, he came out this week and said, uh, we have made it very clear that we are not going to sell Christian and that we are planning with him. Liverpool can save the effort of making an offer. I think that uh, certainly 
is a good idea. I think that Pulisic needs to continue to play at the highest level that he can, and being able to play for a team like Borussia Dortmund is the the best way to do that because he's only 18 years old and he's getting consistent starting minutes in the Bundesliga. We've seen him play in Champions League. We saw him line up against Real Madrid, for goodness, sta- for goodness sakes. No other 18-year-olds in the United States are doing that. They just aren't. If you want to continue to ride the Pulisic train and say there needs to be a player that the U.S. can really, you know, rest their hat on and say, we need, you know, someone to lead us to the promised land. Well, Pulisic certainly could be that guy, kind of like Portugal has done with, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, what Argentina, to an extent, has done with Messi. And of course, Messi's got a pretty darn good supporting cast around him. But, yeah, you, you look at this team, you look at everything that they are trying to do, uh, I just, I don't, uh, I don't disagree. I think that what we're seeing right now is perfect from Borussia Dortmund. I think what we're seeing from Christian Pulisic is perfect. Continue to do what you do, Christian, and uh, honestly, stay in, stay at the highest level as you possibly can for as long as you can as well. There is so many teams that would kill to have a player like him, and Dortmund is a uh, Sitting on a diamond right now, so don't squander it at the same time, Christian, or Bruce Dortmund, for that matter. Very special thanks to everybody that tuned in to the show today. Uh, we definitely missed Simon Provan's presence. He'll be back again hopefully soon. Uh, the show was presented by Attention Era Media today. All guests appeared on the shopfutsal.com call-in line. Special thanks to Dan Lauletta of The Equalizer, Jeff Carlisle of ESPN FC, and RJ Allen of Backline Soccer. If you missed any of today's show, you can go and check it out on demand by heading over to twoupfrontsoccer.com, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and the Sports Podcasting Network as well. If you want to find us on social media, head over to Facebook, Two Upfront Soccer. On Twitter, we are at Two Upfront Soccer. I am at Baxter Colburn. And Simon is at Simon Provan. For all of us here at Two Up Front Soccer, with our manager being the one above, we are Two Up Front.